thank, thank you all for attending. Uh, I'll be presenting a new open source project called IoTivity Constrained. Uh, it's specifically targeted towards uh, resource constrained hardware and software environments. During the course of the talk, I'll discuss a few design decisions that we have made. And while this project uh, implements the Open Connectivity Foundation standards, the similar design philosophies should apply more generally to uh, standards-based software for the Internet of Things. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I'll start by briefly introducing OCF and the IoTivity project, followed by a brief overview of the OCF core standard. Uh, I'll speak about the typical challenges of working in constrained uh, environments uh, and further dive into the IoTivity constraints architecture. I'll then walk through a few code samples, application code samples, to give you an idea of the uh, IoTivity constraints application APIs as they currently stand. And lastly, I'll provide a few guidelines on porting IoTivity constraint to uh, new environments. So the Open Connectivity Foundation was uh, set up in an attempt to uh, solve the problem of fragmentation in machine-to-machine -machine, uh, protocols and standards. Uh, it's an industry consortium with uh, several member companies. The, it, it aims to collaboratively develop and uh, publish open communication standards for the Internet of Things, covering a wide array of vertical use cases. Uh, in addition, it sponsors the IoTVT project, which is an open source project and serves as a reference implementation of these standards. So this talk is specifically about IoTVT Constraint, which is a new project under the IoTVT umbrella of projects. It too is a reference implementation of the OCF standards for resource constrained environments, which is to which is also to say that it is lightweight. Uh, its architecture enables it to be easily customized to various platform configurations. This is an important uh, attribute uh, since, given the variety of uh, hardware and software options that vendors have to choose from. Uh, having a flexible architecture uh, helps to capture a wider base of users and serve them. Uh, to that point, the users who would benefit most more from this project are uh, embedded vendors or makers who would like to tweak their OCF applications and OS bundles at a fine grain level. <coughs> to sort of uh, gain a better understanding of what it means to be constrained, I'll quote from RFC 7228, which presents a classification of uh, constraint devices. Uh, flash and RAM sizes are the key dimensions along which the authors observed a fairly clear clustering of commercially available chips and MCUs, resulting in the three classes. Class zero devices are severely constrained in memory and processing capabilities. Uh, in the best case, they might be connected to the internet uh, uh, via a proxy or a gateway. Class one devices are uh, less constrained than class zero devices, but with a limited code size, they might not be able to employ a full uh, protocol stack to directly talk to other internet connected nodes. However, uh, they might be able to run uh, protocol stacks that are uh, more uh, built for constrained environments, such as the constrained application protocol. But even with that, it might not. It might leave only a few limited resources available to applications. Class two devices are less constrained than class zero and class one devices, but their resources can be better utilized by using uh, lightweight and efficient software, leaving sufficient resources to develop more capable applications. So as you can see, these factors uh, directly influence any design choices that we must make in software based on the class of devices we'd like to uh, target. For OCF specifically, we have the challenge of accommodating at a minimum the operating system, the network stack, the drivers, the OCF protocol, and the OCF application within the constraints. Uh, they might, however, be 
further considerations such as uh, software update, which might also need to be factored in. So the IITVT project uh, has been around for a little less than two years now, and maybe some of you are familiar with it. Uh, it targets multifunction devices such as PCs, smartphones, uh, gateways, tablets. Such devices run a full-featured OS like Linux, Android, Tizen, Windows. Whereas IoTVT constraint targets resource constraint devices, and these devices are the ones that might be battery powered and mostly wireless, such as uh, door locks or uh, environment sensing platforms. Such devices may be connected to a network that is itself constrained, such as low power and lossy networks. Such devices typically run a small OS like Zephyr, Kentucky, Riot OS, Free Art OS. However, both the implementations are uh, uh, protocol compatible. Uh, over the next few slides, I'll just provide a brief uh, overview of the OCF, some key concepts that underlie the OCF core standard. The OCF protocol is based on the RESTful uh, architectural style. Uh, where all things in the Internet of Things are modeled as resources. The CRUDEN, which stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete, and Notify, operations may be performed on these resources via the standard methods get, post, put, and delete. Uh, the things communicate with each other by exchanging uh, resource representations. Uh, the schema of these representations is fully specified by OCF. The observe or notify operation, which is, is, is really a special case of the get method, uh, and is used to subscribe to notifications uh, from a resource when there's a change in its representation. Resources are defined with a common set of properties. Uh, resource URI uh, points to a phys specific physical object. Uh, it has a friendly name, a name property. Uh, resources also have uh, one or more types or interfaces. A type is sort of self-explanatory. It could be a light or a fan, and they have specific names uh, designating those types. And also, they might support one or more interfaces, and where an interface defines the set of operations that uh, are possible on the resource and the nature of their representations. OCF, OCF uh, provides, the OCF specification provides a standard set of uh, resource types and interfaces that uh, applications might use. Resources also have policies associated with them which uh, specify if a, re if a resource is discoverable or observable. Uh, OCF also defines roles that are embodied in applications. The server role describes an application that uh, hosts a set of resources and exposes them to the outside world. The client role describes an application that accesses resources hosted on a server. An application may incorporate both the client and server role uh, at the same time. Such an application might uh, uh, run on a gateway or a proxy device uh, serving as an intermediary. So the OCF protocol is based on the constraint application protocol. Uh, it supports resource discovery uh, with the aid of a fixed well-known resource. Endpoint discovery over IP is uh, performed using multicast uh, requests to an assigned uh, address and port. Since uh, CoAP is usually transported over unreliable uh, network transports, uh, it has a a simplified mechanism for establishing reliability, which uses a stop and wait retransmission model with uh, an exponential back off. Messages that want to utilize this function are marked confirmable and uh, expect an acknowledgement to return from the remote endpoint within a, within a certain time frame, failing which they attempt a retransmission. Uh, OCF data payloads are encoded using the concise binary object representation, which is a compact uh, binary format that is well suited for use over constrained environments. The OCF security model uh, defines mechanisms for authentication and encryption uh, over DTLS, 
and further rely upon access control lists to restrict access to resources. Uh, you, you may refer to the OCF security specification for more details on the security model. Uh, the OCF protocol is designed to work well over UDP and IP as the network transport, but there has been some prior work to uh, uh, adapt it to use the Bluetooth low energy as an alternate network transport. Uh, there is an ongoing effort to refine and standardize this. So uh, the OCF core specification uh, lays out a set of well-known resources that serve specific functions. The OIC slash res resource is uh, specifically for discovery and handles discovery requests. This is something I touched upon in the previous slide. Uh, it takes the, uh, it, it accepts a resource type as a filter, which a client might specify if it wants to discover resources of that particular type. Device and platform are logical concepts uh, defined by OCF which, uh, and their resources pro expose certain metadata, such as uh, manufacturer, uh, operating system, and firmware information, as well as versioning information. Uh, the OIC slash SEC resources serve as interfaces to the security implementation. And likewise, there are uh, a few other uh, well-known resources that always exist. Uh, you can, you may refer to the OCF core specification to gain a better understanding of those. Uh, I'll walk through a few uh, request uh, response sequences with a simple example. In this scenario, we have a smartphone which runs a client application and a light bulb which runs a server application. Uh, the smartphone issues, uh, in order to do res resource discovery, the smartphone issues a multicast get request to the well-known OIC slash res resource. The, the light bulb, have, the server application running on the light bulb receives this and uh, sends a unicast response back to the client uh, with its information, which in this case uh, 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 mentions a resource A slash light with a specific resource type, a supported interface, and its policy is the fact that it's both discoverable and observable. The client that now wants to communicate with this resource sends a unicast get directly to the uh, the light bulb and light bulb endpoint uh, to that specific resource a slash light. The server responds uh, sends a unicast response with its current representation, which contains two properties: state and dim. The client issues a unicast put request to a slash light. Uh, and its payload includes the uh, representation that it wants to uh, essentially put on the server side. The, this basically, uh, the representation mentioned state equal to one and dim equal to 50. So this ends up turning on the, uh, the light bulb and setting the brightness level to 50. The, on successfully completing, completing this operation, the server sends a unicast response indicating a success status to the client. The client now issues a unicast uh, observe request, which is really a get and, and the observe option set in the GoApp header to a slash light. The server accepts the, the, uh, ob the subscription, observer subscription, and sends a unicast response back with its current representation, which remains the same. Uh, that is state equal to one and dim equal to 50. In this example, the light bulb happens to be connected to a physical switch, which someone has just turned off. So this has obviously led to a change in the, uh, in the representation on the server side. And so the server sends a notification back to the client, which had previously subscribed for notifications of, uh, of such. And it, it includes its current representation, state equal to zero and dim equal to zero. So this is roughly how uh, clients and servers interact. So now I will uh, speak about the, uh, the typical challenges of working in constrained environments. These are a few hardware-induced constraints. I've already spoken about the fact that they, you tend to have low RAM and flash capacity. 
Uh, not only does this imply that we must run software that is lightweight, we should also understand that uh, these constraints uh, directly influence certain runtime parameters that uh, that have an impact on the on the uh, that constrain the workload that an application can service. Some of these parameters might be, uh, you know, maximum number of concurrent requests or maximum payload sizes, and this is something we need to factor into and be aware of. Uh, well, while working with low power CPUs that might uh, potentially have a low clock cycle, we need to ensure that frequently used code paths are sort of straight and direct. Uh, we should also limit the number of copy operations. Uh, we should ensure. We should also ensure that the uh, that there is no spinning that happens during periods of inactivity, so that the CPU can be uh, allowed to enter a more uh, a deeper sleep state. All of these uh, uh, considerations uh, improve execution efficiency, which is something that's very essential if, we are work if the device is battery powered. And lastly, we should, the software should be designed such that you could incorporate, uh, easily incorporate only a specific sub subset of features that an application needs. Uh, and not build and compile any more code than the, than is necessary. These are some uh, some of the typical challenges posed by software infrastructures for uh, uh, constrained environments. First of all, the operating system itself is lightweight; it might uh, lack an appropriate network stack or some or or uh, support for persistent storage making the user rely upon uh, third-party uh, proprietary libraries to fulfill those purposes. Uh, there's usually no uh, dynamic memory allocation in these operating systems, which is something that we take for granted on full-featured OSs. Uh, we, we could easily allocate memory statically, but then considerable thought needs to put into the size of those allocations because they would have a direct impact on the performance of the application. Uh, th there's th there are a variety of uh, OS and other choices that developers have. So this leads to a considerable fragmentation in the APIs and also programming models tend to vary. Th there, there can also be a variation in the uh, design of execution context on, amongst the various OSs, as well as their scheduling uh, strategies. S they might be either preemptive or non-preemptive. Uh, for example, Riot OS supports multi-threading. Contiki supports uh, a form of cooperative multitasking. And Zephyr currently has a task and fiber model which serve different purposes. So basically, the point I'm trying to convey is that it's very hard to design a piece of software for a particular environment and easily port it to another when we have to. So all of these points uh, in turn led to the definition of some of these architectural goals that are fulfilled by IoTVT constraint. Firstly, we have a core framework that's essentially cross-platform. It's just pure C code. It encompasses much of the OCF uh, resource model, uh, protocol, memory management, and its execution. It interacts with lower level uh, platform specific functionality via a set of abstract interfaces. These interfaces are defined in, uh, in generic terms and elicit a specific contract from their implementations. The specific functionalities that these interfaces cover span the connectivity, access to a system clock, uh, pseudo-random number generation, and some form of persistent storage. And these are all features that the core framework just relies upon and needs to carry out its functions. Uh, as the core framework is the sole consumer of these interfaces, the, the scope of their definitions is very limited to its needs. And this enables it to be to be implemented on various environments with relative ease and allows uh, rapid porting of activity constraint and deployment on those environments. 
all memory is start, uh, allocated statically in, uh, in, in actually in memory pools. And lastly, the design is modular and enables applications to exclude certain features cleanly without incorporating, without uh, affecting, impacting the rest of the system. So this, this uh, illustration sort of depicts the architecture that I just described. <clears throat> the, the gray box in the middle is the core framework, which is the cross-platform framework. It consumes the abstract interfaces. Compre concrete implementations of all of these interfaces constitute support. And we have a number of ports currently for uh, Zephyr, Riot OS, Kentucky, and Linux. And finally, you have an IoT application that sits and communicates with, with a, through APIs that are exposed by the core framework. So this, this box sort of illustrates the constituent blocks of the core framework, which is essentially like zooming into the gray box from the previous slide. To the right uh, are blocks that handle uh, the uh, OCF, uh, resource model, uh, protocol, and security flows. And they interact uniformly with, um, their, the, uh, with various platform-specific functionalities on different environments via the uh, abstract interfaces. The blocks to the left serve more horizontal functions and deal with uh, uh, managing memory pools as well as the execution. The, the framework executes in an event-driven fashion where uh, the messages are passed between internal modules through the propagation of events. The framework maintains a queue of a fixed size to hold all outstanding events that are to be processed. And these events are processed <clears throat> by the receiving modules uh, to completion in the order in which they were posted. An application essentially needs to then run an event loop in, in its main or background task to execute the framework. The code that implements the client and server roles are kept distinct so that an application can incorporate either of them or both. And lastly, the framework ex exposes a set of APIs for operating on and handling resources as well as working with OCF's data model. This uh, illustration shows the internal workings of IoTivity Constraints event loop. The, a, an application continually calls the OC main poll function and at the same time registers a set of callbacks with the framework. Every invocation of OC main poll processes all outstanding events uh, at that time that are to be processed. The connectivity module at the, on, at the, on the bottom right uh, it, it tends to wait for incoming messages over the network. And when, once, when such a message is received, the, the data buffers are passed as events to either the security or messaging modules, depending on whether the incoming message was encrypted. The security module passes an, a decrypted co-op message to the messaging module. The messaging module decrypts the, uh, the co-op message and uh, passes the, uh, the, the structure to the resource layer, which maps it to OCF resource model constructs, and then uh, calls back into the application to either handle resource requests or, uh, or responses. At the same time, an application can itself, all of this happens in the context of the event loop, everything I just said. At the same time, an application can itself post uh, events, like interrupt events, into the framework for handling. This might be used, for instance, in, uh, in the case where, you'd want, where you wanted to handle data that, uh, that arises out of a hardware interrupt from a sensor. So the, the event loop is uh, sort of uh, designed such that the task that runs it can be, uh, 
can basically enter a, a tickless idle mode during uh, when there is no activity. An application can, in addition, register a callback, uh, which can be invoked to signal the event loop when there is new work. So the code on the slide sort of describes a pattern that applications can use where the code block on the top runs in the application's main task. It, uses a, it, it creates a semaphore to use for uh, signaling. It initializes a semaphore and then starts off the main loop, the event loop. Uh, the, the OC main poll function returns the absolute timestamp of the next scheduled event if there is one, or it returns zero if uh, there is none. The application can now wait on the semaphore either indefinitely or for a period of time. The, the, the signal event loop callback, which is being registered by the application, can be implemented to signal the semaphore. But the way all of this works underneath is that the framework calls the, uh, invokes the signal event loop function when there is new work since it is aware of uh, any such activity, which can come in two forms. One is either if there was an incoming request or a response, or if the application itself posted an interrupt event for processing. Once it, invo once it invokes the signal event loop function, uh, the, you could, it, it would signal the semaphore and then the uh, event loop could resume execution. So I, I will now uh, go over a few application code samples. Uh, and uh, it would, the, the examples would illustrate the APIs as they currently stand. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, applications may incorporate uh, OCF's client or server roles or both. An application is basically implemented over a set of callbacks. Uh, these are required by the framework and they sort of dictate the structure of the application. Uh, these are the set of callbacks that you, you, you would typically define. One is for initialization, uh, for defining and registering OCF uh, resources on, in a server application, uh, resource handlers for all supported methods of defined resources in a server application, uh, an entry point for issuing uh, requests in the client application, and response handlers for all issued requests on, in the client application. And in addition, there is a, a, a framework configuration file that lets you configure some of these uh, various runtime parameters which you would need to uh, make so that you could, uh, so that it meets the needs of, of the application that you're building. So this is done in a file, in a, in a specific header file, config.h. Uh, I'll show you some of those parameters that uh, I'll talk about them later on. So this is an example of, uh, of the main task in an application where you, you set the initialization callback, the callback for uh, signaling the event loop, and callback for registering resources in, in, the, in an OC handler T structure. Uh, you pass that structure over to OC main init, and following a successful initialization, you start executing the main loop. This is an example of the initialization callback, where you typically set the uh, representations for the platform and device resources, which are standard OCF resources, and you pass in some of the required metadata that you'd like to expose, the, like the manufacturer name, the device name, and some versioning information. You might also want to perform uh, any hardware initializations over here, so it's an appropriate place to do that. And in addition, uh, it, it's a place where you can initialize the, uh, uh, the persistent storage uh, hardware that you have on your platform. Oh, so. For, for supporting, so the OCF uh, and IoTBT constraint requires some form of persistent storage to load and store credential and access control information. 
Uh, and this and the framework accesses persistent storage via the storage interface, which is one of the four abstract interfaces. OC storage config is part of the storage interface and uh, takes a particular parameter, which might be some sort of a reference to uh, some area of storage. The behavior of that function really depends on the implementation. In this specific case, where it's taken from the Linux sample, uh, the parameter that it takes refers to a file system path. This is an example of the re resource registration uh, callback, where I'm defining a, a, a resource with URI a slash light of uh, a resource type core dot light. It, it's said to be discoverable and observable. It supports only the get method and uh, sets the resource handler uh, as get get underscore light, which is which is the which is a callback that we'd have to define. So here's an example of the light resource handler for the get method. Uh, if a resource handler supports uh, queries, uh, so basically an application can issue query parameters to, uh, along with the request to a resource, and if a resource handler supports that, it can read those query parameters here by, by calling the uh, OC get query value API. But basically, the, the, what the resource handler needs to do is uh, return a representation of that resource, uh, specifically for the get method. And you can, as you can see here, uh, the, uh, the, the representation consists of an object with two uh, properties, uh, state and brightness level, and they are being set uh, from the application. Uh, what you see here are basically a set of macros that uh, the that are part of the Iativity Constraints APIs to make it to to uh, as an attempt to simplify the process of encoding uh, representations, and we send a response. So here's an example of uh, doing resource discovery on the client side. So at the top uh, is the is the uh, API to issue a discovery request for a particular resource type, OICR.light, and, <clears throat> and also passing in a handle to a callback function to handle the discovery response. The framework uh, invokes this, the discovery response handler for every, uh, separately for every discovered resource that match, match with the uh, filter. So below is an example of the, uh, the discovery response handler, uh, where you you'd basically have to make a copy of the URI as well as the OC server handle T structure that contains the information about the remote endpoint that actually hosts this resource. And these are the two pieces of information that a client would need to subsequently issue a request to that resource. Also, uh, the discovery, the response handler can, uh, has an opportunity to review all of the other resources that were just discovered or by, by, by returning OC uh, continue discovery or can choose to just stop discovery if they are satisfied with uh, what they have found. So uh, here's an example of a client application issuing a GET request to uh, the, the resource that we just discovered. Uh, the, the server handle and URI would have already been populated uh, in the discovery callback. And so you issue an OC do get uh, request uh, using the OC do get API to the URI and server. And you also pass in uh, a query selecting the units that you'd like to use in your, uh, uh, that, that, you'd, that you'd like the, the, uh, the, the resource representation to contain. And you also pass in a response handler for this request named get light. Uh, 
in this in this case you would the uh, this particular request is choosing to not use the uh, coaps reliability mechanism which is the conformable request part which i mentioned earlier and so in order to do that it's just mentioning low qos as a parameter so, uh, which as a result sends a non conformable request that doesn't expect any acknowledgement so here is an example of a response handler that's handling the response uh, the response payload would include the representation uh, encoded in cbor of that particular resource and by the time this uh, callback is invoked it uh, the uh, the payload is already parsed out and so this function gets handed in a structure which uh, the application can just walk through to read all of the properties which were part of the representation so uh, in in the case of, uh, of 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 a conformable request uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, when a client issues a conformable request it expects the uh, the uh, a response within a certain uh, time window failing which it attempts a retransmission but there might be instances where a server might not be able to return a representation within that time frame and yet receive the request correctly so in, in order to uh, prevent the client from needlessly retransmitting the server can respond with a separate with an empty acknowledgement and uh, uh, and and at a later point send a separate response to that request so this is uh, basically how you do it with the apis you declare a separate response handle to track all incoming requests uh, in the resource handler for a for for some resource you would basically uh, use the indicate separate response call to associate uh, to add that request to the handle for tracking and at a later point whenever the response is ready you would uh, you would send a representation the uh, the resource representation back to all of the the uh, endpoints that had requested for that representation in that uh, period of time uh, the framework has the ability to set a callback to trigger after a certain period of time this is done using the oc set delayed callback function Uh, where you specify a period of, a period in seconds so in this instance uh, the the function run after a second runs uh, immediately and uh, uh, inside of inside of that function the the value it returns which could be either done or continue determines whether uh, the uh, whether whether the, whether the application wants to tear down the callback or continue uh, uh, To, to trigger every every uh, uh, like one more time period ahead and this this mechanism can be used for uh, scheduling like uh, periodic requests for instance so lastly for handling uh, interrupts applications have the ability to define uh, a callback uh, and and signal it from a, from a, from a different uh, from an external context that's a context that is external to the one that's running the event loop for example from an interrupt service routine so the callback once signaled ends up running in the context of the event loop so in this case we can see uh, the an example of how you would you would you would define a callback uh, and give it a name uh, register a callback in the during initialization and subsequently signal the callback and this you could use to again handle uh, uh, data from sensors or anything that's uh, externally derived an, an externally derived event to handle that and uh, 
it, it ends up getting synchronized and executing in the, in the context of the event loop. So for instance, uh, this could be used to, uh, to send notifications of uh, sensor data values uh, whenever they get delivered to the application uh, through the ISR. So uh, the framework configuration is something that I spoke about earlier, and these need to be set at build time in a file uh, config.h. So these are some of the parameters that you configure uh, in that file, like the number of application resources, uh, number of uh, request response buffers, like pay maximum payload sizes, memory pool sizes, and DTLS related parameters. So uh, lastly, these are the, I'll just go over uh, the definitions of uh, some of these abstract interfaces that, uh, that you'd need to implement to port IITVT constraint to any new platform. Uh, so this is an example of the, this is the clock interface. Uh, in order to use it, you need to first define the, the resolution of time that IITVT constraint must use. IITVT constraint tracks time in terms of clock ticks. And of course, a higher resolution provides for more, uh, for, for greater precision in uh, timekeeping. Those are defined in the framework configuration. But the interface itself consists of these four functions, which is for initializing, initializing the clock, uh, getting the current time in clock ticks, getting the current time in seconds, and delaying uh, the, uh, the, the flow for a certain period of time. These need to be implemented using the target environment's API. So for example, on Linux, I'd use clock get time to implement these functions. This is, this, these are all the functions that are part of the connectivity interface, uh, where you have functions for initialization with where you might want to set up and configure your sockets. Uh, shut down for, for clearing resources, sending a buffer which uh, basically uh, uh, sends a message to some uh, uh, remote endpoint, uh, sending a multicast message, and getting the currently assigned DTLS port. These are all functions that the framework internally calls, and so they need to be implemented uh, correctly on any target. The OC message T structure contains uh, all the remote endpoint information, which could be the IP, IP address or Bluetooth address, as well as the data buffer. On the receive side, uh, incoming messages may be captured either via polling or, use, or via a blocking weight from a separate thread. Uh, for example, you could, you could do a select to block indefinitely uh, on uh, a site of socket file descriptors on Linux. But <clears throat> once a message is received, uh, the port should construct an OC message T object. And then the messages are injected into the framework via the OC network event call. However, the OC network event function needs to be synchronized with the execution of the event loop itself. And so in instances where it's called from a different thread, uh, it would need, it would, the connectivity implementation would need to even implement these functions using the target environment synchronization primitives to, to achieve that synchronization. On the other hand, if you're working in an environment like Kantiki where there is no preemption, since it uses cooperative multitasking, uh, there is no need to implement these functions because there is no need to synchronize. Uh, this is the pseudo random number generation generator interface. Uh, an implementation might choose to uh, employ some desired seeding strategy if necessary in the initialization, but the framework uh, calls OC random value to, to obtain an unsigned integer whenever it needs a random, uh, random number. And this is the uh, persistent storage interface. I spoke a little bit about OC storage config, which is for initialization. Uh, how it's used entirely depends on the implementation. But OC storage read and write must 
must most definitely uh, implement access to some key value store. Since the framework internally calls these functions to read uh, from keys and write to keys. So to conclude, uh, the project is being actively developed. We have a few uh, working ports for these environments, Riot OS, Zephyr, Kantiki, and Linux. Uh, we're trying to work on uh, filling up some feature gaps from the OCF standards point of view, some enhancements, and our goal is to eventually uh, pass all OCF certification te tests to make it completely OCF certifiable. Uh, and also we, we are still working on uh, better documentation for the project, the code, and, and the APIs. Uh, these are the pointers to the source code as well as the IoTivity dev mailing list where you could post questions. And we'd welcome any uh, involvement or code contributions. So yeah, that's any questions. I'm not that uh, familiar with LWM term, to be honest. But uh, but OCF is based on co-op, and so I guess if you know the difference between co-op and LWM term, then that might. OK. Well, OCF, uh, I guess OCF tries to address sort of the vertical side as well, because we have a lot of work groups that are focused on the needs of various vertical use cases, and so the I think one of the contributions for OCF is the uh, establishment of various data models that work well on for various verticals. At least that's one of the things that they do over that we do over uh, co-op. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure about uh, if LWM to M does something similar or or what. Right. And so uh, do you foresee uh, any, uh, any ways of uh, extending the data, but letting all the processing power and all the important parts uh, to the main function, to sort of the and so on? Uh, so you're talking about offloading functionality, or? Yes. No. Yeah. No. I. I think it really depends on. Uh, well. So. I, I, I guess if you if you looked at the. Uh, the way the event loop executes and the way the framework generally executes it, it tries to uh, behave well in the sense that it, it, it basically goes to sleep. It gives you it gives an application the opportunity to sleep. Uh, so the framework has all of those necessary hooks to enable an application to take advantage of those things to uh, basically behave in a more energy efficient way. Uh, as for the question which you're asking, I guess it also depends upon how frequently you're receiving requests, right? To because that really has an impact on how often you know the uh, the device is executing and performing more work. Uh, so, to some extent, the the application can constrain the number of requests that it can receive, 
by setting those parameters, saying, hey, I, I don't want to accept more than one sort of request at a time. Uh, but I'm, I'm guessing the, the application itself, whoever is designing this for a device, might have to put more thought into how they'd like their device to behave. That's all. But the framework so has those uh, capabilities to enable applications to do whatever best they can. I'm, I'm just not sure if that's an OCF thing. I mean, it seems like. Yeah, what you need to do is limit the interaction to the network if your device isn't very powerful. Right. The main one that you need to be aware of is going to be the multicasting because your, it doesn't depend on you. And um, to solve that, uh, what you basically need is to register your device with a resource directory and then disengage from multicast. So you can be still found, but you're not on multicast. So just leave it for a bigger device to answer that question for you. And then it should be more or less okay. But the one is that um, we're trying to find this to drive architecture on a daily basis without to have one single chip for everything. So Yeah. Your users are going to be doing and uh, how much you can spend on it. There's no one solution. No. Right. But, but I think, I think, I think that the most important thing is actually hang up from multicast. Don't be on multicast unless right. you have to. This is work we're doing, right? But after that, um, it's only when it's directed to you. And if your user is asking you to do something, your device has to be designed for the workflow. Right, and I, I, th I think Tiago's point is a key point that you can actually have a resource directory that sits in between as a proxy to your really low power resource to basically queue up requests and do all of that. And the application can decide how it wants to behave based on who is building the device. Oh. OK. Sure. Uh, no, not, not at the moment. But uh, it shouldn't be particularly difficult. Yes. Okay, so I think uh, to, to answer your first point, I think Minute is something that uh, is definitely of interest to us and something that uh, you know, I, I plan to personally look into. Uh, with regard to certification, uh, I, I think that's sort of the goal, as I mentioned. I think the goal is to eventually be able to pass all certification tests. So the certification group in OCF uh, has laid out a, a large test plan which covers a number of various cases and ensures that you're compliant with the spec, uh, both the core, core specification as well as the security specification. And uh, so, I, yes, I mean, I think the goal is to actually be certifiable so that somebody can take this and really productize it. Yes. Yes. 